Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Today we will be having a look at a paper entitled Incidence of Xeriatric Trauma is Increasing and Comparison of Different Scoring Tools for the Prediction of In-Hospital Mortality in Geriatric Trauma Patients which was recently published in the World Journal of Surgery. This will be followed by a teaching session by Professor Sababella Subramanian on Understanding Diagnostic Tests Part 2. In between the two, um, I will try and give you a very brief overview of the discussion we had during the live session uh, for uh, the paper itself. Enjoy! So, hi guys, my name is Mo. I'm one of the orthopedic trainees at Hull at the moment. Uh, so, considering I do trauma and orthopedics, I thought we'd start to discuss a trauma paper today. So, the paper we chose uh, is the incidence of geriatric trauma is increasing in comparison of different scoring tools for the prediction of in-hospital mortality in geriatric trauma patients. This was published in the World Journal of Emergency Surgery uh, this October by Jiang et al. Um, and today, myself and Gio will be presenting for you, and Prof. Bala Subramanian will be our moderator. So. Uh, the journal. So the World Journal of Emergency Surgery is a subgroup of the BMC, which is Biomed Central. That's UK based, uh, which is uh, part of the Spring and Nature Group. The journal itself was founded in 2007. It's the official journal of the World Society of Emergency Surgery, and it has an impact factor of 4.1, which is actually very similar to many of the more established journals out there. So it's doing quite well. With regards to Libing Jeng, I might be pronouncing that horribly, I'm sorry if I put to the name. Um, he's emerg an emergency medicine specialist uh, in the Department of Emergency Medicine in Zhejiang uh, University School of Medicine. And he has um, quite a few papers published around the ICU and trauma patient cohort. Um, so, I'll let right, you let's uh, dig into a little bit of background and why this paper is uh, important. Well, uh, we do know that trauma is a very common cause of death uh, throughout all age groups, uh, particularly in young people, uh, but it's significantly increasing uh, throughout the world in the geriatric population as well. And we do know that um, all people that do suffer from trauma tend to have a poorer prognosis for various reasons, from uh, the limited physiological reserve to the multiple uh, other medical problems that they tend to have and obviously medications such as blood thinners that can complicate their management quite significantly. Uh, there's quite a few uh, outcome predictors available in the literature, um, both for the general population and for the geriatric population, um, but very few are actually validated specifically for the uh, elderly. And uh, this paper fits very well in that category, looking at various different type of uh, predictors and trying to define uh, if they are good enough to predict mortality, not so much morbidity and mortality. So there's two aims really uh, for this paper, and these two aims will kind of come with us throughout the entirety of the presentation. Uh, the first aim is to determine whether geriatric trauma is actually increasing in prevalence throughout the world, uh, not specifically in a particular country. Uh, and the second aim is to evaluate the ability of five outcome predictability scores uh, in terms of determining patient's prognosis and particularly death. So I'll give the floor to Mo to talk about the uh, scores that they will be using in this paper. So we're going to quickly have to fly through some of these scores. Um, so there's five that this paper basically describes, uh, the ISS, the NISS, the TRIS, uh, the Apache and the SPAS2. So the ISS is the Injury Severity Score. It's an anatomical score. Uh, it was theorized by Baker et al. in 1974, and it is based on six uh, standardizing severity of traumatic injury uh, and the worst injury in six body systems. Um, it has a max of 75, and basically it allows us to get a general overview and predict the mortality based on these injuries. The problem with that one is it didn't really 
tend to include if there was multiple severe injuries in one body part. So they came out with the new uh, ISS and that takes the three most severe injuries, even in the same body part, to stop underestimating or underrepresenting the severity of trauma sustained. Um, the TRIS is a mix of anatomical and physiological measures. So in theory, it should have a high specificity for the predicting mortality in trauma patients. And that is based on the revised trauma score uh, and the injury severity score. Um, the TRIS has become the standard approach for evaluation of outcomes of trauma care in many trauma centres. And that was theorised by Boyd et al. in 1987. Um, the Apache score. So many of us are aware of this one. It's a physiological score. The Apache 2 score is a pro estimate of ICU mortality based on laboratory values and um, patient signs taking both acute and chronic diseases into account. Uh, the data should be from the initial 24 hours um, of the ICU admission and we should be using the worst values um, po uh, that we get on that day. So we go on to the SPAS2, which also uses 12 routine physiological measurements, um, along with the age and the admission type. And this is the simplified acute physiolo physiology score. Uh, so 24 hours after admissions to ICU, the measurements should be completed and an integer is given between 0 and 163, which translates to a predicted mortality between 0 and 100%. So I've like literally whizzed through all of those. I've got all these papers at the end as references just because we need to make time for the rest of the presentation. But I thought I'd just give a quick overview of what these scores are so that the rest might make a little bit more sense. So we've got two anatomical scores, two physiological, and one that's the TRIST, which is a mix of both. So, Gio. Right, so going back to uh, our study. Uh, so this is a retrospective cohort study uh, based on uh, databases, uh, I would say. Um, as we mentioned originally, there's two aims here. So aim one, if you remember, was to evaluate whether the prevalence of geriatric trauma is increasing throughout the world. In order to achieve this, the authors looked at two big databases, one from the United States, the uh, NTDB, and one from Germany, DGU, uh, in two different, slightly different time frames. And they look at the amount of patients recorded in that database uh, of age 65 or above, or 60 or above, depending on what database we're talking about. Uh, and they simply look at how that uh, number has changed in time throughout uh, those about 10 years. Uh, concerning game number two, uh, they actually take uh, a database that was used for another trial, another study uh, in Switzerland, including 300 severely injured geriatric patients, and they perform a secondary analysis on that uh, cohort, uh, trying to determine whether the scores that we just discussed were able to predict mortality and outcomes in that particular cohort. So just remember, there's two different aims and two very different patient populations here that are being analysed. Uh, Mo, uh, back to you. Yeah. So as you just said, um, there's 311 patients in concerning the Swiss database, and they were split into a survivor group and a death group. And for both of those, an AUC rock score uh, was plotted and evaluated uh, to help us predict the mortality in the geriatric trauma. So that's the ISS, NISS, TRIS, Apache, and SPAS2. So uh, very briefly, uh, these are some of the results for uh, AIM-1. So the top left chart uh, represents the um, increment in uh, geriatric trauma patients in the American database. A uh, very similar picture is visible on the middle chart, which represents the overall trend uh, in Germany. And finally, on the right side, uh, this is a little bit amusing to me, uh, it's a representation of the um, average age uh, of the population uh, in uh, China uh, and how it has increased throughout time. And the author kind of implies that given that the population has increased uh, in average age, probably trauma in the elderly has also increased without really providing much data on top of that. Uh, the chart at the bottom end uh, is actually from a different paper. This is UK data. And this is just to highlight how actually the picture is very similar in this country. Uh, you can see that trauma uh, in uh, younger populations have remained pretty much static, if not really declining, uh, while it has significantly increased uh, in the elderly populations. Uh, so, ball to you, Mo.
Perfect. So back to the Swiss database of the 311 patients, we had 147 who survived and there's 164 deaths. So it was mainly due to blunt trauma from a fall less than two meters. And it was found that the patients with a high GCS and hemoglobin tended to be in the survival group and especially those with the lower age and also a lower lactate on admission. So according to the um, area under the curve analysis, it shows that the NIS, so the new injury severity score, and the TRIS outperformed the physiological base scores, the Apache and the S-PASS. Um, having said that, the, the second uh, graph on the right, that was for the TRIS score. Gio, do you know why they represented the TRIS score in a separate graph? Because I couldn't quite figure it out from the paper. So I couldn't really figure it out either, um, meaning that the author doesn't really provide an explanation why they do that. The only thing I can think of is that the TRIS does have a different um, scoring system whereby the scale is inverted compared to Apache SAPS, ISS and NISS. So the lower your score in the TRIS, the higher your mortality and vice versa. Now, I'm not sure that's an adequate explanation because sensitivity and specificity tend to be absolute numbers anyway, as well as should the uh, ROC um, curve um, the representation. So uh, I'm not entirely sure. I couldn't find out uh, on um, uh, on the paper. I don't know if uh, Prof has any particular ideas about this, but we'll ask him at the end. Uh, ball back to you, Mo. Fair enough. So with regards to limitations, there were self-reported limitations and some that me and Gio felt we found. So with regards to the self-reported, they've claimed that only two country databases are analyzed to describe age profile, even though they do briefly uh, mention the Chinese um, database. They've also completely omitted the use of the GTOS, which is the Geriatric Trauma Outcome Score, which I would have thought would have been perfect for this paper, but they've said that they've not used it, they've not explained why, but they've been very clear that they, they're clear that they know it exists and that they haven't used it. Also that they are very aware of the limitations of a secondary analysis of a cohort data. Um, so yeah, they've understood that the, the data that was collected wasn't quite for the purpose that they've used it for, but they've gone ahead anyway. So with regards to the other limitations, I'll let Gio just touch on those. Yeah, so there's a few other uh, sort of points that we picked on. Um, as we mentioned, this, and as you most certainly saw during the presentation, uh, the databases that they use to identify uh, prevalence uh, of geriatric trauma um, are picked in different time frames. Slightly different, but, but different. Uh, probably different enough to probably say that there might have been some changes in the way trauma gets managed, particularly in the sort of 2010s um, in uh, various countries throughout Europe uh, with the introduction of trauma centers. Um, severe trauma is not very well defined throughout the paper, uh, particularly when they uh, analyze the Swiss cohort. Uh, it was originally well described in the paper that originally reported that cohort, but not particularly well in this one. Um, I am not sure how relevant the outcome that they picked is. Um, Obviously, estimating mortality for a trauma patient is relevant, is important, but nowadays, especially in the geriatric population, you do want to know a bit more about morbidity and what's the likelihood of a patient not just getting out of hospital, but in what state. Um, they did identify in the 300 uh, odd patient that they included uh, some baseline differences in characteristics. Uh, and they did not make any attempt in uh, uh, smoothing down those differences um, before actually applying the scoring system. So I'm, I'm pondering whether they should have perhaps propensity matched the cohorts uh, or use some logistic regression uh, methods to try and account particularly for variables that are not included in the scoring system, such as age, uh, which would be quite relevant in this, in this context. Um, the Swiss database uh, as well is not really put into context very well, uh, meaning that they don't really say if um, they recorded in the Swiss center they took the data from an increase in geriatric trauma throughout uh, the um, period of the study. Um, Ball back to you more for conclusions. Fine, so let's wrap it up quickly. The bottom line of this paper is that geriatric trauma is on the increase rapidly due to aging populations. And uh, from the a uh, area under the curve uh, graphs that the NISS and TRIS uh, basically outweigh the Apache and SAPS too. 
what I basically got out of this paper is that the anatomical predictability scores are better than the physiological ones in this case. Um, and then we've got this table that summarizes the good and the bad points that we thought were highlighted throughout the presentation. I'm not going to read it out because I think we've said most of the points and it's just humoring you guys. So I think this is a bit where I take any questions. Um, I've got a slide with the references and and then I've also got the PDF, uh, the PDFs of all the papers. If anyone actually wants to go through them, I'm happy to send them through. In this very brief session, I will try and give you an overview uh, of the most important points that came out of the discussion of this paper uh, throughout uh, the live session. So as you most certainly have noticed uh, throughout the title uh, and uh, the text uh, of the paper, the authors uh, talk about increasing incidence of geriatric trauma um, in uh, populations of both the United States and Germany. If you look carefully, however, throughout the paper, they highlight how the relative number of trauma patients admitted to hospitals uh, is increasing uh, in comparison to other trauma patients. They don't really specify if the number of geriatric patients affected by trauma over the total number of geriatric patients in the populations in a certain amount of time uh, is actually increasing. So they're not really talking about incidents uh, here. And this brings us back to uh, one of our previous episodes where we encountered a similar problem. Uh, if you remember, um, we were talking about appendicitis in pregnancy. A further very important point here um, is related to the nature of the uh, scoring system that are compared um, throughout the paper. So the author set out to use ISS, NIS and TRIS. Uh, these three scoring systems um, are designed to be used at admission of the patient. They also use um, Apache 2 and uh, SAPS 2, which are on the other hand designed to be used at admission uh, at the ICU. This is quite a significant difference as um, both SAPS 2 and Apache 2 can be quite significantly affected by pre-ICU management and therefore in real life differences detected between the different scoring systems would be a reflection potentially of pre-ICU settings management rather than a genuine difference between the different scoring systems. To give you an example, uh, patients that did not survive the initial management uh, will not be in real life included in the scoring systems such as uh, Apache 2 uh, and SAPS 2 as they would never really get into uh, ICU. Uh, this is an example of immortal time or survivorship bias. Finally, um, we briefly discussed why uh, the three score uh, in this particular paper is highlighted on a separate chart compared to uh, the uh, other ones and we couldn't really find um, an answer before we'll be asking uh, the authors concerning this. Right, uh, I'll leave you uh, with the uh, Prof. Saba teaching session. Enjoy. Yes. Lovely. Right, so we discussed um, a little bit about diagnostic tests uh, last time, and these are the points we touched upon. So for each of these diagnostic tests that we do in our clinical practice, there are lots of different parameters that we can use to assess how useful these tests are. We talked about sensitivity and specificity, which includes accuracy as well. We talked about predictive values, positive and negative predictive values. And we talked about likelihood ratios, likelihood ratio of a positive test and likelihood ratio of a negative test. Right, so we then uh, discussed that sensitivity and specificity have a really important role in research and can be used in comparing different diagnostic tests. So you can compare the sensitivities and specificities of different tests, like maybe the use of CRP and uh, white cell count in the diagnosis of, diagnosis of appendicitis, for example. But just the values, the sensitivity value and the specificity value uh, is of little use in clinical practice. Yeah, so we discussed an example and we looked at why sensitivity and specificity are not directly useful for the average clinician. We then talked about predictive values, and I emphasize that predictive values have a really important role in screening, and we're going to talk about that again. And we said that likelihood ratios uh, 
the likelihood ratio of a positive test particularly um, is really useful in estimating post-test probabilities, and that's why likelihood ratios are of value in clinical practice, right? So um, if you wanted to uh, look back at these slides, they, then they're there on the YouTube, they're there on the website, so you know, feel free to have uh, a look again. I thought we should um, cover two other aspects before we conclude the chapter on diagnostic and screening test. One is the rock curve, and it fits in nicely with the paper we've discussed today. And the other is the issues in relation to screening tests. So let's look at the rock curve first. Now, if you have a straightforward uh, diagnostic test, and by straightforward, I mean a test that'll give you an, a yes or no answer, then um, it becomes very easy to use that test in clinical practice. It, is, it becomes very easy to assess the usefulness of the test. So if you have uh, an ultrasound that you're doing for right eye for the pain and the sonologist or the radiologist tells you it is appendicitis or it isn't, then you've got a binary yes or no answer from that diagnostic test. And therefore, uh, you can go ahead with the next step in your management pathway. If you do a biopsy on a lump in the lung that uh, and you're looking for cancer, then you're expecting the biopsy to be either positive or negative, and then you use the positive or negative result to move forward. What if the test is quantitative? What if the test is uh, a number on a scale? Let's consider an example. Let's say there's a new interleukin, and uh, not necessarily six, but something called interleukin X, that you're researching and you're looking at the value of that interleukin in, in the serum in acute appendicitis and let's say the values seem to range from 1 to 100 picograms per ml and let's say you've done a study in appendicitis patients and, and, and in controls and you find that the this particular interleukin x is higher in appendicitis patients compared to controls. So you've got a mean value of 17 appendicitis and you've got a mean value of 55 in controls. And then you've got this um, dilemma as to what level, what threshold do I use to, um, to say beyond this level you've got appendicitis or below this level you haven't got appendicitis. So in, in these kinds of questions, plotting this ROC curve, receiver operating characteristic curve, uh, can help you uh, calculate the sensitivity and specificity, or one minus specificity, and I'll explain that in a minute, for each value of this particular um, interleukin. Uh, I've got a peptide here, but, but th that, uh, let's say, is interleukin for the diagnosis of appendicitis. Okay, so uh, here's a, a, an example of a rock curve. We've looked at this in this paper just a few minutes ago. So essentially, in a rock curve, what you do is you plot the true positive on the y-axis. The true positive is the same as the sens sensitivity. If you think about it, go back to the uh, formula for sensitivity, you'll realize that sensitivity is the same as true positive. And then on the x-axis, you plot the specificity or the inverse of specificity, one minus specificity, which is simply the false positive rate. So if you take, um, let's consider this blue line, and let's consider that the blue line represents the value of this new interleukin, and you're looking at it um, uh, as potential in the diagnosis of appendicitis. What you're saying is, as your sensitivity goes up, for any test, the specificity is going to go down. Or, in other words, the one minus specificity is going to go up. So what you say is because you do not know what value of interleukin X is going to be useful, for every value, you plot the sensitivity over one minus specificity. So, um, and then you get a curve, and that is what is called the rock curve or the, R, or the ROC curve. Now, in an ideal test, you will find that you, uh, the curve uh, takes the shape of a very a straight line going right up and then a cutting across and moving towards the um, upper right corner of the screen. In other words, a test that is useless or of little value will fall along this, di um, this diagonal, right? A test that is of little value will fall along the diagonal. So the higher or the further away the curve is from the di diagonal, 
the more useful the test is going to be. So if you wanted um, a really perfect test, then you will hope that um, you will that the curve will be well away from the diagonal following my laser pointer. And then you will be able to choose a point on the curve that gives you maximum sensitivity and maximum specificity or the lowest one minus specificity on the x-axis. And it is furthest away from the diagonal. In other words, the area under that curve will be as high as you can get. So you're looking at the area under the curve, which is uh, the area uh, or the area of the graph that's between the curve and the diagonal. You're looking to see how far away from the diagonal the curve is. And, uh, um, and then you're going to decide on the point furthest away from the diagonal in choosing your cutoff. So that is one very important use of the rock curve. Another use of the rock curve, as has been described and discussed in the paper, is when you're comparing two, three, or four different uh, diagnostic scores, if you like, and you want to look at the area under the curve for each of these diagnostic tests. And typically, you would choose the test that's got the maximum area under the curve. So that's another useful um, value of using rock curves um, i.e. you compare different diagnostic tests which um, effectively are quantitative measures of whatever you want to predict and you look at the area under the curve. Okay, so hopefully that, that um, um, gives you some insight into what ROC curves are. Right, Let, let's then move on to screening tests. So we talked a lot about diagnostic tests and I thought we should conclude the lecture on diagnostic tests by talking a little bit about screening tests. The screening tests effectively are like diagnostic tests. You're looking to see how you can improve the prediction of a particular problem or a disease that you're interested in. The only difference between the diagnostic and screening tests are that screening tests are done in a population that are healthy or do not manifest signs and symptoms of disease. So, you do screening tests to hopefully try and prevent disease or you want to de uh, detect disease early. It could be population screening where you're not really stratifying the people you're screening in terms of their risk of having the disease. Uh, or you could be doing opportunistic screening or screening in high risk settings. So examples in surgery would be screening for malignancies like breast cancer and bowel cancer maybe screening for aortic aneurysm in otherwise asymptomatic people who may be at risk. And also, you're all very familiar with the screening for um, MRSA. You do a swab MRSA swab as a preoperative screening tool. So these are some examples of screening tests. And that's why I think we should be understanding the limitations of screening tests, at least the general principles um, of um, the, uh, the pitfalls of using screening tests. Right, so when we talk of screening, we've got to take a step back and uh, have a think about what would be an ideal screening test. It really depends partly on what you're screening for as well, but the World Health Organization laid down a series of principles and where, where they outlined what would be an ideal screening test, and they were talking about this in the context of infectious diseases and also of cancer. Right. So essentially what they say is you've got to be screening for an important health problem, obviously. A lot of these are fairly logical and, and obvious statements, but it's useful to keep them in mind. And they say that you've got to have a simple, safe, precise and validated test. They say that the treatment of early stage disease, this is in the context of cancer sometimes and also infectious disease should provide benefit, reduce morbidity, mortality, and outweigh harm. In other words, um, there should be some benefit in screening early, and you might think this is a pretty um, commonsensical thing to say, but you'll be surprised how many times um, in science and research we embark on screening without necessarily having a really optimum strategy to, uh, uh, to implement when you screen for something early. 
A typical example would be uh, this discussion about screening for Alzheimer's and dementia and so on, and um, when uh, we may not necessarily have effective uh, treatments to institute at an early stage of the disease. So you might uh, you might just wonder, you know, what's the point in screening and inducing anxiety when you do not have anything to change the natural history of the disease? Obviously, screening should be cost effective and you need to be able to demonstrate these days that the um, that the intervention would then be of some benefit in improving quality of life and improving survival. And um, it should be beneficial in terms of cost per quality, quality, quality referring to quality adjusted life here. If it's a very expensive uh, test, which does not give you enough life years, then obviously many societies will not be able to afford them. And if you're introducing a screening program in your practice or in your region, then obviously there needs to be a plan for audit and standards. And patients should be fully informed not just of the benefits of screening, but also the risks of screening. OK, so the key um, things to remember is that screening tests are associated with a number of significant limitations and often we tend to overlook these uh, limitations and focus primarily on the benefits. Now I won't spend any time on the benefits because uh, they, they, they are self-explanatory but I'll just go through a couple of slides on limitations. Now there are two important limitations you need to think about. One is called the lead time bias and the other is called the length time or the overdiagnosis bias, right? So any screening test will obviously end up in increasing the incidence of the problem because you're probably detecting the disease early and you might be detecting a disease in many instances which may not manifest um, in the course of the individual's lifetime, okay? So we'll come to lead time and length time bias in a minute. The other things to consider are the psychological impact of false positive test results. This is particularly important in the context of um, cancer screening. There's also morbidity of treatment and costs of treatment. And when you look at screening tests in cancer, if you look at the literature, you will find that often the discussion is about reduction in cancer specific mortality. And people don't talk much about whether there is an impact on overall or all cause mortality in cancer. So if you look at uh, the trials of screening in bowel cancer and colorectal and uh, breast cancer, you will find that the literature is full of how the screening intervention reduces colorectal cancer specific death and breast cancer specific death, but they keep a bit quiet about overall mortality. And you might think that if you reduce uh, cancer specific death, then inevitably you will reduce overall mortality. But if you think about it, that may not necessarily be the case. It may be, it may not be that you're really reducing overall mortality because you might be picking um, uh, diseases in an elderly population where there are competing risks to mortality. There might be lots of other things that might uh, uh, influence mortality. All right. Let's talk about length, lead time bias. You've probably heard of this uh, in the context of screening, but uh, here is uh, an explanation. So let's assume that you have um, a, a person has cancer, say, at the age of 50 and becomes symptomatic of cancer at the age of 50 and then goes to the GP and gets diagnosed and treated in secondary care and they succumb to the cancer at the age of 60. So they've lived for 10 years following detection, diagnosis, and treatment of that cancer. Let's suppose the same individual was um, in a screening program for that specific cancer, and the cancer was detected on screening at the age of 45, so five years before they would have otherwise detected it um, by virtue of having symptoms. And let's say you didn't start treatment, or there's no specific treatment for the early diagnosis, and you simply started treatment at 50, and they still died at 60. Now, that particular patient who was screen detected would have lived, lived for 15 years, whereas if they had symptomatic detection, they would have lived for only 10 years. So you can see that even without any specific or beneficial intervention for a screen detected cancer, just by treating them in the usual way, i.e. when they got symptoms, 
you spuriously are increasing their life um, expectancy or survival after diagnosis by an extra five years without really having offered them any treatment. So this is what is called lead time bias. And this is a fallacy seen in so many observational screening studies that observational screening studies are now considered um, completely worthless because you know, they do not take into account the fact that you know, lead time bias could have um, influenced their results systematically. And that's why it's important that randomized controlled trials are done for screening. And even in randomized controlled trials, sometimes over analysis of the results um, can, uh, can, uh, can be influenced by lead time bias. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. The next is the bias of overdiagnosis, or some people call it um, length time bias. And I'll explain this um, with this figure. So let's assume that um, on the x-axis of this graph you have time, and on the y-axis you have extent of disease. And let's assume that if we're talking about a specific disease where, uh, which progresses over time, and some people die of the disease. So the first group of patients here um, over time succumb to the disease. And then you've got another group of patients where maybe the disease is a bit more indolent and uh, you have some patients dying of the disease but other patients dying of natural causes, i.e. of causes unrelated to the disease or what we would say competing causes of death. And then you've got a third group of patients who don't really succumb to the disease, but then end up dying of maybe a chest infection or a myocardial infarction or a road traffic accident and what have you, right? So um, let's say that you are in a situation in a setting where uh, you're only diagnosing the disease after it becomes clinically obvious, i.e. when they get symptoms. So in that cohort, you will, um, uh, you, you're likely to see that a lot of pe people are going to die from the disease and only a few people will die of natural causes. Now let's say for this particular disease or cancer, you implement a screening intervention, and then you're picking up the disease much early in the natural history. So this is the cohort. And you will see that a lot more patients uh, that you pick up from this screen detected intervention, you're gonna pick up really early, and uh, you will find that um, they're going to be a lot more people are going to be dying of natural causes because you're de detecting them early and, uh, and you may be subjecting them to treatment. But again, there are these competing interests or competing diseases that would influence their mortality. Now, if you detect uh, patients even early by introducing another more effective, what you think is a very efficacious screening test, what you're doing is you're going to be picking up loads and loads of patients who are going to be dying of natural causes. So picking up disease or detecting disease, um, either by doing excessive um, scanning, like CT scans and MRI and so on, and PET scans that we, that we tend to do all too often these days, or by implementing a screening test, will result in the diagnosis of disease that, that may never become manifest in the course of the individual's lifetime. So that's a problem, that's the overdiagnosis bias or length time bias, which is a huge problem in um, screening tests. Okay, so take home points. So we've uh, learned before in the previous um, lecture that predictive values are what are really important for screening tests and likelihood ratios are important for diagnostic tests, right? In the first lecture, we also emphasized how understanding pretest probability is really important to be able to use diagnostic test results effectively. If you do not know pretest probability, then you're not going to be um, in a position to use the results of the diagnostic test to, to the benefit of your patients. Um, we talked about rock curves in this lecture, and, and I hope you remember that rock curves are useful for either comparing tests or for deciding what thresholds or cutoffs to use in a test that is that gives you a quantitative result, not a yes or no answer. And then we talked about screening briefly, and um, I explained what lead time bias means and what overdiagnosis bias means.
Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast. <laughs>